Good morning. Let's take a breath together. So this morning's talk is we are stardust. And for years, we said we were, but we didn't have science to back it up. And now we do. Isn't that interesting? Not going to go into the whole scientific spectrography and all that because it, it hurts our brains to think too deeply in the intellect. But check this out. For decades, science popularized humans are made of stardust, and now a new survey of 150,000 stars shows just how true that old cliche is. Humans and their galaxy have about 97% of the same atoms and the same elements of life appear to be prevalent toward the galaxy's center. 97%. The difference is in amount. Right? We're way more oxygen than the stars. We're about 65% oxygen. Stars are about 1% oxygen. But we still contain the same stuff. Right? I don't know about you, but I find that fascinating. And more specifically, in our own star galaxy. Because right? that's what they were testing is what's in the Milky Way galaxy. So we may eventually find out that we're connected to all galaxies, which I suspect is the case. Right? Because scientifically, one of the things that has always fascinated me is science can agree that the physical realm started with the Big Bang, what started, what, what did the Big Bang come out of? Because for things to go bang, there had to be something. And we cannot yet explain scientifically, definitively, what that something is, where it came from. And I love science. And I laugh at science sometimes because there's this whole element called promissorial science. And promissorial science simply is the science that asks us to, well, just believe me now and someday I'll prove it. Not so much. <laughs> Not so much. Because when I look logically at the unfolding of life, there's something that happens beyond science. There's a resonance that happens within my being that I don't need science to explain. It's never going to be able to explain it anyway. It's that presence. It's that thing that I feel, that I sense, that connection with all life. If you've never had a palpable moment of oneness, I invite you to meditate more, to change how you move in the world, to open to such an experience. Mine came in ministerial school quite unexpectedly. It was actually in a class on consciousness and studying that there has to be some element of consciousness in everything if all life is created out of consciousness. And I was in the throes of writing my final paper for this class. And after about 36 hours at the computer, I had to take a break. <laughs> and I walked out of my house and I walked to the end of my driveway and I just happened to look down the street that I lived on. And there was this amazing sunset happening. 
And in a split second, there was something inside of me that recognized I am that sunset. That I was, that, that the self, the divine self, was looking at itself in a diversified form. And it moved me in a place that I still cannot explain. And the interesting part, much like we learn from the Buddha, the minute I became aware, consciously, humanly aware of what was happening, it was over. Because then my brain kicked in and tried to explain it and limit it. <laughs> so that's what happens with awakening. That's why we keep practicing. Because the minute our brain gets involved, now, now we're into a whole different realm. Don't make it a bad thing, just makes it a thing. Okay. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Anybody not familiar with Neil deGrasse Tyson? He's, he's the physicist that um, took away Pluto <laughs> as a planet. He says this, two things. We are part of this universe. We are in this universe. But perhaps the most important, perhaps more important than both of these facts is that the universe is in us. Okay? He takes away the separation. Another one of his quotes, we are all connected to each other biologically, to the earth chemically, to the rest of the universe anatomically. It's amazing. Now, fun facts. <laughs> the, the, I had fun playing with this. Humans, right? You are 99.9% .9 genetically identical to the person you're sitting next to, to the person sitting behind you, to the person sitting in front of you, to the person that has different political views as you. 99.9% .9 the same. Perhaps we really are connected. Perhaps. Now, it's easy to wrap our head around, okay, I'm genetically connected to humans. All right. 96% to chimpanzees. Right? We don't have a whole lot of problem with that. But did you know that genetically you're 90% the same as an obsidian domesticated cat? Because <laughs> you are. 85% of your DNA is similar and identical to mice. 50% of the non-coded DNA we share with mice. 80% we share with domesticated cattle. 60% we share with chickens. And my favorite, we share 60% of the DNA with the banana. <laughs> See, it's not just animals. Right? We are connected to everything. So what gets in our way? Socialization. Everything we've learned from the neck up gets in our way. <laughs> Right? Because we're taught generationally that we are separate. Right? We, you know, Bible verses, people know Bible verses that have never been through the doors of a church. This whole idea that humans are positioned in dominion over the earth, straight out of the Bible, most people know that even ones that have never been in the doors of a church. This place of human supremacy, if you will. Well, who made it that way? Pretty sure we did. And I wonder sometimes, does the tiger think about its position of supremacy when it's chasing one of us? <laughs> I don't know. But I'm curious... You know, when I 
order my dog to do something and he turns around and looks at me like, whatever, silly human. Does he have a perception that he is superior to me? I don't know. And there's no way to know. And so I think the bigger invitation is instead of looking for how we're different, to begin to acknowledge and search out all the ways that we're the same. Now, many of you know, I have years in 12-step recovery. And probably the first five years, I spent separating myself from everybody else in the room. I would listen to people's shares and, well, I'm not that. Well, I'm not that. And it was suggested to me that maybe I stop looking at people and just look at shoes during the meeting. And I was like, excuse me? Yeah, just look at shoes. And notice, pay attention. Are you noticing how everybody has different shoes? Or are you noticing that everybody has feet? We are a choice. We can find the differences or we can find the commonality. And so what if we entered every interaction from a perspective, from a commitment of finding where we're similar? Where we're similar. Even if we have to start with the exterior. Right? Even if we start with, I have a head, they have a head. Okay. <laughs> they have a mouth, I have a mouth. I'm using mine silently, they're using theirs verbally. Because <laughs> right? many of us, right, one of my favorite exercises is to ask an audience, how many people talk to themselves? And invariably, someone will not raise their hand, and yet inside their head, did they not just say, I don't talk to myself. <laughs> we all do it we all compare because we're taught to it doesn't make it a negative sometimes comparison matters if I'm buying produce I'm going to compare so that I get what I've been taught is the best produce. I'm not, you know, if I ignore it, I'm going to get home with rotten fruit, and then I'm going to be on some level of domestic trouble. <laughs> See, the guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> what if we noticed how we're similar? What if we committed to just see the presence of God, the presence of Spirit, to stop getting attached to one another's conditioning, to one another's socialization, to one another's thoughts, and dare to be curious. Why do you think that? Say more. Share deeper. To invite those challenging conversations, mostly that challenge our own thinking. See, the conversation itself is not hard. What's hard is navigating all of the stuff that comes up inside of our own head that wants to argue with someone else's experience, that wants to argue with someone else's perspective, that wants to separate ourselves. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say none of you stand on your front porch at night, look up at the stars which you're deeply connected to and argue with them about why they look the way they do and why you look the way you do. It's not going to happen. Right? We don't stand out in nature and watch a rabbit take off running when it's approached by something and vilify the rabbit. None of us stand in that field, Hey, rabbit! You got a fear issue! You need to let go of that fear thinking. None of us do that. In fact, most of us recognize and celebrate what a brilliant instinct <laughs> that the rabbit has enough sense to take off. And yet, we don't do that with ourselves. 
we vilify our normal human responses. Now, there is such a thing as thought fear, but it is not connected to your autonomic nervous system. Your autonomic nervous system, the fight or flight, actually operates 100% independent of thought. It fires off, and then you become aware of it, and then your thinking begins. And so perhaps we have that same brilliant system that the rabbit has. But we teach each other to ignore it, to vilify it. And if we can normalize that, then we can take responsibility for what we scare ourselves with that has nothing to do with our fear response. Nothing. That's all mental mumbo-jumbo where we're writing a narrative, right? And most of it comes in the what if. Anybody else play what if? Right? What if, and then we run all the scenarios. And it's the rare person that runs the scenario, what if magnificence happens? Because <laughs> that's an option. But nobody tells us it's an option. Nobody tells us it's an option to what if ourselves right smack dab into the middle of magnificence. <laughs> it's your choice. And nobody, nobody on this planet can choose for you. They can't make you choose anything. They can limit your options. True story. There are consequences for every choice. Some of them amazing, some of them unwanted, most of them unexpected. But it's still your choice. And so the more consciously, the more intentionally we choose, the more results we get that we want. And so I invite you, start finding where you connect. Start being intentionally aware that every time you take a breath, you're breathing the same air as everything in the universe. Everything. That you are surrounded by it, infused with it, that you are. And I'll keep saying this until everybody comes to me one at a time and says, I got it, you don't need to say it anymore. You are an on-purpose, intentional divine idea you are a smile in the heart of creation itself to know itself as you it infused you with 100 percent of its power to create and it just gives you free will to create whatever your heart desires because your heart is its heart. That's how it expands itself is as its creation. Own it. Love it. Choose to be daring. Choose to be bold. Choose to consciously. Choose knowing. And here's the catch. That everything you choose for you, you choose for all of humanity because there's only one thing happening. It's only one. That's the important part of the connection. That everything I choose impacts the whole. I'll wrap up with this. If you don't believe that's true... Next time you stump your toe, call me. I don't care what time of night it is. Call me and tell me what part of your body did not know that happened. <laughs> right? Our body is a microcosm of the macro. Everything we experience, the whole experiences. So let yourself begin to be aware of what you're adding and what you're experiencing. If it isn't what you want, you have the power to shift the experience. Quit focusing on shifting other people. When you change something anywhere, you change it everywhere. 
going to say that one more time. When you change something anywhere, by the truth of oneness, you change it everywhere. Let's take this into prayer. <sighs> I celebrate. I celebrate the oneness of life. I celebrate the awareness of the connection of everything. I celebrate the truth that thoughts are things, that the infinite, unformed substance makes itself known as form. I celebrate the power of choice. I celebrate the truth that what happens anywhere happens everywhere. And I commit myself again and again and again to choose consciously, to create consciously, intentionally, and to see God and only God in every element of life. And I invite you to join me in this celebration, in this intention, as we say together, and so it is. <laughs>